Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. After 40 days of Lent, the Church gives us 40 days to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, sometimes we struggle to believe in the message of the resurrection. Life seems to contradict that message of hope that we would like to trust in. And yet, Jesus himself struggled during his ministry on earth. He struggled in Gethsemane. There was the pain and the humiliation of the cross. That means perhaps that by his struggle, he can meet with us in our own struggle. And by the cross and the resurrection, he builds a bridge for us, which leads towards a new faith in God, a new trust in God. This coming Sunday, in many churches, the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus will be read. It's from Luke chapter 24. And for me, one of the questions which lies behind this story is, what happens when we meet with our own unbelief? There are events in life which seem to shatter our faith when we lose trust. What happens in those moments? Is everything lost? It's the day of the resurrection of Jesus. And we meet with two disciples who are leaving Jerusalem. They're returning to their home village. And if you look at the text, then we understand that they've already heard the news of Jesus' resurrection. One of the disciples is called Cleopas. The other has no name. 
Is that something that Luke does so that we can find our place on this journey as well? They leave Jerusalem behind. Why are they leaving Jerusalem behind? From what they say later, it's because they're disappointed. They put all their hopes in Jesus and his death on the cross seems to have shattered those hopes. In some ways, their hopes were misplaced because they expected something from Jesus, which he was not. And they have dismissed too easily the words of the women who were at the tomb earlier that morning. They're blinded by their sorrow and by their disappointment. In Luke's Gospel and in the Acts, Jerusalem, it's the place of the fulfilment of all God's promises. In turning their back on Jerusalem, it's as if they're turning their backs on the promises of God. And they leave behind the community of believers. They're on their own. And yet, as they're walking, a stranger comes up to them. He sees their sadness and he asks them a question. The reader knows that this stranger is the risen Jesus. But the disciples do not recognise him. What does this mean? We have here something a little bit strange. We're told that their eyes were kept from recognising Jesus. This is an example of what the Bible scholars call the divine passive. There's an example in Matthew's Gospel, which you all know perhaps. Now, give and it will be given to you. In Jewish tradition, when God was acting, you avoided naming God directly. Give and it will be given to you was a way of saying give and God will give to you. Here, it's the passive voice, which says that in some ways, God prevents them from recognising Jesus at that moment. Why is that? It's perhaps because at this stage in their journey, they're not yet ready to recognise Jesus as he truly is. There's still steps that they have to take. But I think we understand something else as well. The presence of the risen Christ, it's a humble presence. Jesus does not seek to impose himself upon them. He doesn't seek to draw attention to himself, but he makes himself close to them. He begins this relationship with them. And his presence, it isn't dependent upon them recognising him. He walks with them. Risen from the dead, Jesus can be close to every human being, and meets them in their own reality. The reality of these two disciples at this moment, it's their unbelief, it's their disappointment. And that's where Jesus meets them. Yes, when we read on, we can understand he's a little bit frustrated with them. The words he uses can seem harsh, but there are also times when we need shaking up. And see that Jesus does not reject them because of their unbelief, because of their lack of understanding. He continues to walk with them. And their unbelief, in fact, becomes the meeting point with him and enables him to reveal more about himself. Jesus explains from the scriptures everything which points towards him. If you like, he reshapes the faith of these two disciples. See how he accompanies them. He doesn't interrupt them. He listens to what they have to say. And it's only then that he begins to explain. He's patient. He doesn't interrupt them with his version of the facts. What the two have said it's like a collection of facts 
There's nothing that comes from within. That inner eye of faith, which would help them to understand what they've heard already from the women, is not yet there. The Messiah they had imagined was not the Messiah Jesus is. Jesus himself will teach them everything that they need to know. A first point of reflection. During these past weeks, when did you feel discouraged like these two disciples? When did you feel disappointed? What or who helped you during these moments? Try to give thanks for that help that you received. The journey continues and as the night draws on they reach the village of Emmaus. When we look at the text then we see that Jesus makes as if to go on. He still does not impose himself upon these two disciples. But the tradition of hospitality demands that the two disciples welcome him. But I think there's something more as well. Because we're told that they urge him strongly. They want Jesus to stay with them. Something has been set alight in their hearts. It's much more than simply responding tra to tradition. A fire of living love has been kindled within them. Perhaps it reminds us of Abraham, who in Genesis welcomed three strangers and afterwards understood that it was God who was visiting him. And so the two welcome this stranger. And as they sit at table, we're told that Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Luke uses the same verbs that he used back in chapter 22, where he described how Jesus acted at the Last Supper. And at that moment, suddenly, in the breaking of the bread, the two disciples recognise Jesus. Suddenly, we're told that their eyes were opened. The blindness of the two disciples is removed. They see Jesus as he is. But at that moment, Jesus vanishes from their sight. Once they've recognised Jesus, the need to see him disappears. Their hearts were burning within them, they recognise, as he explained the scriptures. Already they'd sensed something of his presence, without being able to put words upon it. But now something of Jesus' life has become reality in the disciples. And they will carry that presence with them. A presence which is no longer limited by time and by space in their own lives. It will become something that they can share with others. A second point of reflection. When did you sense something of the life of Jesus becoming a reality in your own life over these past weeks? The disciples' hearts, as we said, were burning within them as Jesus explained the scriptures to them. If you've recently read from the Bible, when did your heart burn within you? It's night, but there's a joy in these two disciples. A joy which means that they cannot stay on their own. A joy which means that they have to leave their village and return to Jerusalem. The journey out to the village was long. They talked and they talked about the past. But in two short verses, they're almost immediately back in Jerusalem. What counts now, it's not the past, but what lies ahead of them. And as they return 
to Jerusalem, they returned to the community of the other disciples. And the other disciples, they confirm their faith. Indeed, it is true, they say, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Their faith is confirmed by the faith of the others. Now, there's something very beautiful there, and that's perhaps my third point yeah, for your reflection. Many of us at this moment, we're living far away from the community of believers that we know. But soon we will be able to join them again. What will be the message of joy that we will bring from our experience of these past weeks? What will be the message of hope that we give to others? Because for these two disciples, they are also risen from the dead. There's something, they are the same, but there's something which has changed within them. The resurrection life brings courage where before there was only discouragement. It sees life being born anew where before there seemed only death. It gives hope where before there was only disappointment. What will be the hope? What will be the life? What will be the joy that you'll share with others?